So if there was one rule you could take back. Well, <laughs> um, I'd say they... I'd say the cap. I, I, I'm more upset by the cap than I am by the, uh, you know, we, the on ice rule I would, I think that they might have to change just because it's just unsafe is the red line, which is a strange thing. And that'll just slow the game up a little bit, but, but I'm more upset by the cap. That right. drives me crazy. You, just, you tell a story in the book, um, just to take you back a little bit to your boyhood when you were playing high school football and, uh, you tell a story of missing a field goal and how it has shaped you to this day in terms of how you do interviews and how you look at athletes and how, how you treat athletes. And I, I was just wondering if you'd, I found it very poignant and I was yeah, wondering if you'd it, be willing to it, it, it share that. It's definitely one of the favorite stories of my life. And it's uh, <clears throat> when I was in grade 12, I had a, uh, I kicked field goals. That was, you know, I always laugh. There was a guy we know, Bob Murdoch, played in the NHL and coached in the NHL and his daughter is a pretty high level swimmer made it as high as national team swimming. And he said to me one day, we were at, I was at the Etobicoke Olympium watching her. And he said, you know, Ron, she, she has to be certifiably insane to go into the pool every morning and swim up and down, looking at the bottom of a pool. And I didn't tell him, but I used to kick field goals by myself. I, and I would, you know, kick the ball 55 <laughs> yards, have to go fetch it, <laughs> come back, you know, and I, I couldn't really kick from the end zone the other way, so I had to come all the way back to the 45-yard line and kick the ball again and go fetch it. And I mean, if anybody saw me, it was like, woo -hoo. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, I did this for years on end. And uh, in my senior year of high school, grade 12 in Alberta, 1978, I had a 34-yard field goal from the left hash marks to win the championship. And, and I just could not believe. Now, there's a little bit of a subtext to that. If you're a football fan, you know that from the 34-yard line means it's a 20. You're actually, the line of scrimmage is the 27. You know Paul's a football player. Uh, so at the 27-yard line, we ought to have been able to just punted it through the end zone, got the single point to break the 10-10 tie and win the game. But I think the coach wanted me to have the kick. And uh, we didn't really have a good punter anyway. I was more apt to kick it further field goal kicking. But I honestly think I, I delude myself into thinking Donnie Sinclair, who was always hard on me as a player, wanted me to have the privilege of that opportunity. And I was grateful, I really was grateful that it came down to me to kick to win a high school title. And I missed the field goal. I kicked it right over the right upright, right over the upright, so that we all sort of stood spellbound watching, kicked it nice and high. Uh, but it went over the upright and they ruled it wide. And it sailed 21 yards in the old days, the end zones were 25 yards deep, sailed 21 yards deep, and wouldn't you know it, the kid from Delburn Trojans ran it 131 yards the other way <laughs> to score the game-winning touchdown. We lost the, not only did I miss, but we lost the game on the play. And uh, I, just, I just remember striking it pure and striking it the way I wanted to strike it. Uh, I had to get it elevated because we'd had one blocked earlier by a complete foul up on our own side. And... I just didn't feel bad. I, 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 it sort of told me that you did everything in your power to be ready for that moment. Thank God, uh, whoever, you know, that I even got the chance. And I left it at that. And, and from that moment on, it was like nobody could tell me that it, and Brian Trottier has the line, it's not in the book, I, I just, he has the line, uh, it's not important that the dream comes true, it's important that you live the dream. And that was how it was for me. I, I, I've, and I feel that way, you know, when I watched this, I gotta be careful here, but when I watched this at Vancouver, go out of our minds at the gold medal count and uh, how important winning was, a little part of me died because it isn't as important to me as it is to some to, to get the, the prize. It's more to just do the act and to feel like you gave it your best. And I think we all kind of secretly feel that way, but we tend to wrap ourselves sometimes at an Olympics in the flag and get carried away with a bit of nationalism and gold. Given that attitude, is there a... A player you've watched over the years, there's a, a guy that sort of exemplifies that for you where maybe he wasn't, you don't see him carrying the cup, but he's somebody who was always there giving it his best. And, and uh, I'd say Wendell Clark would come to mind as a Toronto Maple Leaf that was total heart and soul guy that uh, brought you out of your seat every time. Scotty Bowman described him as the fastest six seconds of anything he'd ever seen, whether it's getting, <laughs> getting away a wrist shot, jumping into a hole to get to a shot, or throwing a punch. Uh, thought he was uh, extremely selfless. Uh, everything I would want to see in a hockey player was Wendell Clark, and he didn't win anything, so I'd put him right there. Yeah. What was your own uh, hockey career? I was a good little hockey player, scared skinny. Uh, I, I 
Started in Whitehorse, Yukon when I was four years old, so got lots of ice. And I was a, <laughs> I don't want to say I was a gifted skater, but I was definitely a noticeable skater. On any team I ever played on, I was the, the guy you'd notice. Uh, probably should have moved into figure skating, but anyway. <laughs> I, I had no uh, nerve. I just didn't believe much in myself. And I, I was always, and I, to this day, I'm a little bit ADD. So, uh, but I, I played pretty high. You know, I was, like I say, I was captain of all the teams. And uh, so respected, at least within the teams. And I was a good cut up in the dressing room. Bad for coaches, because I was, thought they were Bettman. And uh, <laughs> I, should, I should tell you one story uh, about Bettman that's funny. And this, this is in the book. But this kind of sums up why Bettman gets it. In 1999, Don Cherry and I were doing the Toronto Buffalo series. Dominic Hasek missed the first game, it didn't matter. Dwayne Rolison played for Buffalo, played great. And Buffalo won in five games. Now, Don and I come home to Mississauga and Oakville, where we live, and we get a phone call. We'd like you to go down to Dallas, Texas for the seventh game of the Colorado Dallas series, the Western semifinal or, you know, the third round, seventh game. Could you please fly down? Oh, all right. You know, we've been working for seven weeks. Do we really have to go to Texas? All right, we'll go. Of course, you'd think we'd be happy, but we're a little bit probably hung over and just tired. And so we fly down to Dallas, and uh, Don Sherry goes to the hotel to pick out his suit, and I go to the <laughs> rink. <laughs> and, and, and when I get to the reunion arena, they didn't have their new rink yet. When I get to the reunion arena, Scott Russell had been hosting the shows, and he, he gave me this device called a Humidex, and he said, here, Ron, it shows the, the relative humidity is a real problem. It's been at 99% all week, and it's causing horrible problems for the ice makers. So what I do is I just press that button, and it'll reveal the relative humidity right at game time, and you can show that on the opening. I said, oh, thanks, Scott. That sounds great. So I go out, you know, for the start of the pregame show, half an hour to game time, and I've got my little... Humidex and I, well, as you can see, it's uh, reading 98% right now. Temperature here in Dallas, Texas, June uh, 12th, whatever it was, it's uh, 104 degrees Fahrenheit and with an RH of 98. It's a, a very serious concern for the uh, ice maker, Dan Craig, and they're concerned whether or not we'll have good ice for the third period of this very important seventh and deciding game between the Avalanche and the Stars. And now here's a feature on Rocket Richard. And the commissioner of the NHL, Gary Bettman, came running over to me from the sidelines. <laughs> Ron, why do you have to be so negative? <laughs> and uh, damned if he didn't have a good point. I was kind of negative. To come. I was thinking, Scott, why did you ever give me that thing? But anyway, uh, he did have a point, but I, I bantam rooster that I am. I said, well, geez, Gary, if it wasn't June 12th, we wouldn't have to worry about the relative humidity in Dallas, would we? Because <laughs> the hockey just goes on and on, right? So back and forth, the two of us go like two bantam roosters. So and then... After that's all said and done, and we argued the whole half hour off air, but we argued about whether or not I should have talked about the bad ice. So I go into the little dressing room that we're going to use for our studio where Don Cherry's sitting like you are there, Paul, and I come into the room to watch the first period and I say to Don Cherry, Gary Bettman wasn't too happy with me talking about the relative humidity and the bad ice, and Don Cherry says, oh, is that right? <laughs> and he doesn't say another word, right? And, <laughs> So now we get on the coach's corner in the first intermission, and Don says, hold it. Hold it. A little something before we get rolling here, folks. Uh, you know, <laughs> we're down here, two of the luckiest guys on earth. We get invited to come down to Dallas, Texas for the seventh and deciding game of a fantastic series. You know, Ron, I didn't know this, but I, I found out when I got here, there are more professional hockey teams per capita in Texas than there are anywhere in the world. Did you know that? No, probably not. And did you know that they just came out of Colorado the other night? They had their 350th consecutive sellout. Unbelievable. ESPN ratings are over the moon. You got Joe Sackick versus uh, Mike Madonna. You got Eddie Belfort, Patrick Waugh. Unbelievable series. Seventh and deciding game. Saturday night, long weekend. Everybody's in a good mood. <laughs> Except you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh no, <laughs> Ron McLean, investigative reporter extraordinaire, got to stand up there with his little thermometer <laughs> and try and ruin it for everybody. So now, of course, I am killing myself because I know he's got me cold, right? I, I'm not mad at all. I'm a little disappointed that he's got me that good. But so then it, as the segment ends, we throw to commercial, in comes Bettman, right into the room. Thank you, Don. <laughs> 
Thank you, Don. So what would you do? You're no wonder he's getting it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No. You don't. You don't have to buy the book if I keep this. Up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I could ask you questions all night. I'm. This is great. But oh. uh, I, I think probably some of you have some questions too. So. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. There's a microphone right there in the middle of the floor. If you'd like to step up. Yeah, thanks. To what extent do you feel uh, Gary Bettman, either publicly or privately, had to eat crow when we saw the Atlanta franchise move up to Winnipeg? And has that opened the floodgate or set the precedent for us to see one or more, one or two more teams come to Canada? Do you do believe think, in the next ten years? I, I do think you'll see more. I think you'll see a team in Quebec City. I don't know which team it'll be, but I think the eating crow part will be Phoenix. That's the one where he is really really sort of staked his uh, reputation within the Board of Governors because he's sort of promised them that he won't lose money on that. He's been funding, you know, bless his heart, he's, he's doing a great job of running Phoenix and running Dallas in the wake of a tough U.S. economy. So I'll give him that. I just, uh, all my point was when I interviewed him was, look, the players are tucking aside money in escrow to forfeit if they don't make enough money at the NHL level. Uh, it's not fair to the players that you're trying to keep Atlanta going and Phoenix going when clearly they do much better in Winnipeg and Quebec. So I think you're right. I think it'll be, probably will be Phoenix will end up in Quebec because that, that situation's just untenable. Uh, I'd like to change the uh, topic from hockey just a little bit to another show you're doing re oh, good. more recently, yeah. um, Battle of the Blades. Yeah, and, I, should um, I should tell you a good blade story too. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's incredible. I mean, um, uh, the, uh, the production, the, the skaters, the hockey players, those women are so brave. No helmets, you know, no elbow pads. I mean, good. Isn't it Lord. true? I mean, honestly. It's incredible. I mean, it, you know. Uh, so anyway, uh, the only difficulty is uh, it's getting that, as JR said the other night, um, you look like a figure skater. Yeah. So I was thinking, I had a thought the other day, um, being like Joe Bowen, an, an old goalie, um, why don't next year... Let's try and do it with only goalies. Well, we tried so hard this year to have Kevin Weeks. We tried to cajole Kevin 50 ways, and we could not get him to break down and do it. I, I, you know, I don't know if the goalies are terrified of, uh, of the lifts. You, you, you would have well, known. You know, I think Darren Pang and Violetta would just be a perfect pair. You Wouldn't know? they, They're both about the same size. A Annabelle Langlois. <laughs> Annabelle's more uh, Darren's size. Uh, yeah, okay, she's even smaller. Yeah, yeah, right. Anyway, but you tell Healy next time you see him that you're, he's a chicken because if those other guys, yeah. they, hey, they can commentate all night long and say, should have done this, should have done that. Put the goalies out and let's see how they we do. We tried with that. Osgood too. Chris Osgood retired in Detroit <laughs> and we yeah. tried really hard to get, we tried to get Mike Medano for that matter. Anyway, anyway, uh, it's, but, it's fantastic and I just think it's, it, what they do is just absolutely amazing. And those yeah, women, I'm with you. I, I, the the women brave. are beyond brave. And the guys are in a way as well. And I'll tell you this, or do you want to just read the story of Katarina? <laughs> you want to hear that? No, no. My favorite Blade story so far is our first show. Our first show was, uh, you think, have you heard this story? No. Or read this story? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So on the very first show of the series, all Kurt Browning and I have to do skating-wise is I'm in hockey skates, he's in figure, because we wanted that juxtaposition, is to skate, we were in the Maple Leaf Gardens, to skate from the Zamboni area to center ice and on a downbeat of the Brian Adams uh, red dress song, you know, we had I go like this, and Kurt Browning goes like this, and then we skate on down to the camera at the far end of the arena and do the good evening, welcome to Battle of the Blades. But I couldn't hear the beat and the music to do this part. I was having a real problem with that. And Kurt Browning was having to go five, six, seven, eight, you know. <laughs> and, and, and he was having to guide me through it, which was hilarious. Anyway, we got through it. We did it pretty successfully. The show went reasonably smoothly. We were all on pins and needles for fear of a fall or an accident. And so Kurt said to me, you know, Ron, in figure skating, what we do is if we've had a good show, we try to replicate some maneuver out of that show backstage the next show, and that's called a goodie. That's your good luck, superstition, whatever. And he said, so you and I had a good show. Let's do this backstage. I'll, you do that, and I'll do this together. And, and he, oh, he went like this, you know, and that's that. We performed that little stunt backstage about four minutes to air every show. We've done it every show since that opening show three years ago. 
Then he told me a great story about how when Katarina Witt and Kurt were at the height, right? She'd won the 84 and 88 gold medals and Kurt was the four-time world champion at the end of the 80s. They were the stars of Stars on Ice. And they'd go all around North America and it was Kurt and Katarina. And the rest of the cast would be back in the dressing room while Kurt and Katarina were out doing the media, e-talk and People Magazine and all the news, you know, and it was just getting on the skaters' nerves that these two were getting all the publicity. So one of the guys in the men's dressing room decided we're being treated like manure, really. We're having to wait two hours to get on the bus and move to the next city. So he decided he would pose nude upside down against the wall. And his theory was that, now this is uh, the Toronto Library, Tina. You let me know, you let me know if this is editable. Uh, not edible, editable. Uh, I'm at, the theory was when a male is upside down naked, his package looks like a mushroom. So that's why he was, that, that was the metaphor somehow that this skater had, uh, that this mushroom was how we were being treated. Later, the girls started to do that. And when Katarina Witt did her spread in Playboy magazine in 1999, the only, there's only two Playboys ever sold out in the history of Playboy, the original with Marilyn Monroe, and Katarina Witz in 1999, but she posed nude upside down against a tree, and she did it specifically for all the skaters in figure skating, and that was her, that was her goodie. For, for that. That's a, that is a true story, yeah. A little, little bit racy, but a true story. I unfortunately have forgotten the question I was yeah. going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, not But you haven't lost your wit. Oh. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, that, that's how it works, sorry. Uh, uh, pr practice makes perfect. Yeah. Each year as we get further uh, into the further rounds of the playoffs and we, uh, at the Olympic level hockey, we find that the necessity of fighting is not an important part of the game. Do you see it um, going by the wayside one day, yeah. and especially in light of the fact that so many of the fights today are staged and not because of someone's being upset with someone else. I don't really have a problem with the stage, and I'll get back to that in a minute, but I, I do think fighting's going the way of the dodo bird. And I, you know, fighting, listen, I never defended it on the cathartic point of view or the spectacle point of view, but when, when a player, like last year in the NHL, Zdeno Ochara had to make a decision as Max, Max Pacioretty of Montreal went sailing by him, he had to make a decision, do I hit him or don't I? And the only thing we'll ever know for sure is that Chara did not not go out to make the hit. He did go and make the hit. And so to police the sport, to make it safe for everybody, you have to, because the game happens at 100 miles an hour, it's actually a subconscious uh, decision that you make to, to prevent somebody from getting hurt. And the subconscious only kicks in by some form of uh, uh, imprinting. And fighting used to be that. The fact that you knew if you took liberties, some big guy was going to come and grab you and throttle you in front of your teammates, 16,000 fans and 2 million viewers. That was a great deterrent, and that was a reason to have fighting in hockey. Now, because the game evolved and we had, uh, obviously, the European influence, we had, you know, so a lot of guys who'd never fought in their lives and didn't relate to that version of imprinting, uh, we need now the referee or hockey operations to create that imprint that if I do this, these are the consequences. And it's a very slow go. It's, a, it's, a, it's harder without extremely stiff suspensions to put the fear of God into the players in their subconscious, not in their thinking, because they can't think that fast. That's, that's why fighting had a role. And it's hard to explain to folks, but it's why in baseball, the bean ball was right there as an option. And it was why in you know other sports, there are certain weird little, uh, subcultures that you know allow for for this kind of violence and, and and the other thing i'd say about fighting that i always defended on the basis of is when you try to create a soldier none of us likes war of course but what is it that makes for a good soldier like pierre de coubertin created the olympic games on the basis of why are the french doing so lousy in these wars why are the english doing so well could it be they learned on the you know battlefields of eton and oxford are those lessons of sport, competitive sport, actually translating into how they soldier? He thought so. And, and again, you, you need these microcosms in life of, uh, of risk, of tests, uh, of your courage, of your bravery, of your selflessness. And fighting actually fell within the 
context of that. But as I say, the game changed, the, 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 the constituents changed, and so now we're going to go down that path where it's going to be Brendan Shanahan in New York, big brother, sending that subliminal message to the players that they'll file in the back of their head, this is going to cost me X amount of dollars, and that is a big deterrent, and or a certain number of games, because all players want to play. So I think what you'll see is that. Thank you. I'm just wondering whether the uh, injuries that are caused in our hockey games today is mainly due because of the, uh, the better protection that the players have. Was, has anybody done any studies on the uh, injuries, say, in the 30s or the 40s that uh, the players had as compared to today? The, there, uh, there's uh, actually some evidence, though, to suggest, like, you'll remember, Gordy Howe broke his skull trying to hit Teeter Kennedy. Uh, Jean Beliveau was injured in 1962 and had a severe concussion and missed a, a good length of time. Bobby Orr was hit by Pat Quinn. I mean, the, the injuries, Bill Masterton died in an NHL game, you know, so I think there are, uh, there's no doubt you're right that the equipment, you know, the more we uh, speed up the game because you feel safer and the more we make you feel invulnerable so you take risks, the chances are heightened and it is a, a product of the, but, but the studies have shown that uh, concussion levels have kind of steadied it around 100 a year for whatever reason, that's, and that's reported in uh, concussions, right, because how many guys hide the symptoms or play through it. But I do think that uh, while the equipment is uh, a key and they're trying to minimize the gear a little bit and, and reduce its, uh, especially the elbow pad, shoulder pad size and, and plasticity, um, I just think you'll always have in a, in a f hockey game the possibility of concussions and CTE for sure. It's, it's a factor though. And they, they are working at that quite, quite uh, diligently right now to reduce the size of the gear. But Bill Masterson died without a helmet, right? So we're not, you're not going to win that one. And Brian Burrard has no eye. Will you agree that Don Cherry is pro-fighting? And because he is, and he describes the game, I get very upset when he gets to the line, and now you kids... I don't think the two should go together. Well, there, there again, I'll defend, I, I, I sort of understand what you're saying, but I, again, I'll come back to this uh, notion of why I think fighting is analogous to soldiering. And, I, and I, it's strange as it seems, uh, there, there's a little, like Rick Mercer just did a beautiful, uh, I'll get sidetracked if I go on to that, but he did a beautiful dissertation on James, Jamie Hubley, the youngster, 15-year-old who was bullied in Ottawa and died. And the basic gist of Mercer's new attack I liked, which was, come on, anyone who's gay, please say so, don't hide from it, uh, and, and make us all feel welcome. Versus, let's eliminate bullying words. Uh, because I do think when you cultivate the fear of a word, uh, you're sending a message that leads to, a, and, and Don is, Don's pro-fighting, as I said, is a little bit honorable. A fight is throw the gauntlet, both men consensually agree to drop their gloves and uh, do it the honorable way. There's, there's aspects of uh, honor within the fight that I think a child should learn. However, because of the way the game is played today, I very seldom hear any description about stick handling. Well, in I my agree. day, there was a Max Bentley. Yes, I agree. I said that to Paul off uh, stage here today. I am a thousand percent with you on that. And I'll tell you what I think they've done again is speed up the game so that it's north south or linear. You know, as Paul described it. Yeah, Yarmer Yager came back after three years over in Russia and he said, What's the biggest difference? He said, The puck's not on anyone's stick. The puck is everywhere but on someone's stick. Guys are going 100 miles an hour, they're chipping it into the corner, they know they can't be hit so by the defenseman, so they go and that's their method. Rather than dipsy doodle as Max did, they just chip it down to that far corner where the goalie can't go play it. Totally right, you are totally right. And I, I, I write about that in the book, I'm not happy at all with the lack of playmaking or good passing. I don't like the curved stick. I don't like the synergy, the composite either. <laughs> and I used to like the wrist shot. Yeah. And I noticed the slap shot has receded as well. Yeah. Thanks. You are right on everything. Yeah, and I, but I, I, but I, I would. <laughs> I like, never. Yeah. That's because I'm an old, old man. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, here, here we go. 
I uh, just want to say I'm a huge Dodge Fer Cherry fan and go back as far as the grapevine with uh, yeah. thank you, with my wife and I uh, every uh, Tuesday night at 6.30. She'd make sure that I was on my ho way home with Swiss Chalet. And then, uh, and then uh, further from that, it was always make sure uh, you catch me for Don and Ron. I guess what I'm saying is it's been an era, and uh, I'm sure Don's got at least a decade left in him. I certainly hope so. But at some point in time, um, is there a succession plan? Uh, do you have anybody in mind? Uh, I'm, I'm hoping you're a constant, but... Uh. No, but you're right. It's, uh, I don't think you'll ever find, like I said, I think he was uniquely qualified. I think the reason, you know, much to the chagrin of uh, so many who always say, why isn't there a better counter-argument to Don Cherry, or why doesn't uh, CBC muzzle this guy, you know, it's not Don's fault that he built the constituency he built. He had something special. Going to be very hard to find that. I... Uh, I think the next guy will have to be a guy like Scotty Bowman or Wayne Gretzky. Uh, Paul, I don't know how you feel about this, but I think it will have to go a whole different tack. I, I don't think it can be somebody who pontificated on leadership, which Don has done. You know, he, he is definitely, as I said to you, his Lord Nelson and Drake come through time and again, and uh, his, you kids out there, you know, on the one hand, he's, you know, make sure you get up when you're bloodied. You know, those are all good messages. And uh, uh, he, I just don't know if we'll ever find a guy that's as well schooled in that element of life and hockey. That's that's a tough mix. And he's. I, I agree with you. Yeah. The, so it'll it'll have to be a guy that Gretzky is a brilliant guy. I could but, listen to Wayne. How Gretzky about Kipper? Talk. You don't care about brilliant? No, I said how about I said how about Nick Kiprios? Kipper. Well, Kipper's um, Kipper's great, uh, but just. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't see him in the same uh, church of uh, knowledge of Drake and uh, <laughs> Nelson, you know, and or the movie stars, you know, like Don, Don's, Don's showbiz. Don is, uh, Sinatra stole from Jolson, he stole from Jackie Gleason, he stole from Sammy Davis and all these different, you know, he took all these different methods of showbiz, just as Steve Martin did. There, there's, there's certain people out there that are rare, that, that are so studious, and they, they come along once, like Bobby Orr's and Gretzky's do. They come along once in every 25 years. And I don't put Nick in that category. I love him to death as a good analyst. But Fair he's enough. just not, not in the league of Don's depth. And that piece that you brought out about him being so well-read, I'm now a bigger fan of Don Cherry than when I walked into the room tonight. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you very much. You bet. Yeah. I have a loud voice. Good. <laughs> Go ahead. That's okay. No, you were first. You were first, so go ahead. Thank you. Um, if you took hockey out of the equation, what would a day in the uh, Good question. Yeah. Yeah, I really, you know, if I, I say in the book, if I was going to do something next, I loved Jurgen Goth had a radio show from 3 to 6 on CBC Radio 2, and it was just a simple little show, nice music. And he talked about cooking and Tuscany and wine. I think he liked scotch. I'm, I can't drink that or I'd be, I'm belligerent enough on wine. Um, <laughs> but I, I definitely am a fan of food and drink and uh, love to walk my dog, love to do a little bit of exercise. Very simple, very, you know, kind of like us all at, at my age, I kind of am thinking a little bit about how to let it all hang out and yet let not, not have it that it all hangs out. So, you know. <laughs> Like the um, skater against yeah, the wall. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I definitely uh, would see myself doing, a, I, I used to think I could teach. I'm not sure at my age I would be, uh, I just feel like the world clicked on us all with the social media, right? And I don't know that I'm Twitter savvy or Facebook savvy or whatever the savvy you need to be to teach. I, I'd have to really see if I could do it. So I might just revert to a simple radio show with music. And uh, in my case, it would be storytelling about... Uh, you know, a different different kind of vacation than Jurgen's, but but now, similar. You like to sail as well, don't you? Yeah. In the off season. Yeah, and so I always thought vacation radio would be a lovely format where <laughs> every week you, you you tune into Ron's show, and this week it comes to you from the British Virgin Islands, <laughs> and 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 we're aboard a uh, 53 foot you know Nautilus, and uh, that that's that's an idea I have that probably start next week. <laughs> Very much. So yeah. You are a wonderful guest. Yeah.